Okay, fine. So um, let's carry on where we were. Um, we were um, talking last week about Yehuda ben Bava, um, who was one of the ten uh, martyrs that we read about on Tisha B'Av and on Yom Kippur. He was age 70 or 90, depending on which version you uh, take. And the reason we were talking about him was because our Gemara said that he uh, will be remembered, Zachor Latov, he will be remembered for good, specifically because he ordained five or maybe six, depending on which version, uh, rabbis uh, in, uh, in uh, what's the word, defiance of the Roman uh, uh, edict that anybody who uh, did smicha, anybody who received smicha, the town where smicha would be done and the tchum, the area around the town, would all be destroyed. Um, it was a very harsh decree and Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava um, gave his life for it because what he did was, he, uh, as we learned last week, he sat in between the two towns of, um, what were they called? One was Usha and one was Shafaram. And I showed you the map. There's a map over here. Uh, uh, you haven't got the screen, have you? Let me show you the screen. So there's the map. Um, it, there's Haifa, obviously, with a little novel there. Usha, Shafarim. Sipori around about there. We spoke about that last week. And uh, what happened to him was uh, he, he went and sat between the two towns in the mountains so that the towns would not be destroyed. Um, and when he, they saw these fellows here, the Roman soldiers coming, um, he said to his students, you take, go and run away and I'll stay here. Um, and they came and they did not move from there until they'd inserted 300 iron spears into him making him appear like a sieve pierced with many holes. So that was what happened to Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava. He is um, remembered for good because he, uh, um, he managed to ordain these rabbis, which was very important because, as we also learned last week or the week before, maybe, um, the, the, uh, an ordained rabbi has permission to rule on cases regarding fines. And if there aren't any ordained rabbis, then there can be no cases heard which uh, could have fines. And what would that lead to? If there were no cases that could go to fines, what would that lead to? Everyone being dishonest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It would lead to dishonesty and it would lead yeah. to lawlessness and anarchy because there would be no redress. If there weren't any courts, and people will just do whatever they want. Um, and so if you think about it, what Rabbi Huda ben Bava did was actually something which uh, was one of those um, things that you see uh, it, from time to time in history, where a small act has the most amazing repercussions uh, later in history. Um, and had he not done this, then there would have been uh, a complete inability by um, the rabbis to have any kind of authority, any kind of teeth, any kind of punishments, um, and they would have ended up with anarchy. So if you think about it, what Rabbi Yehuda Bava did um, actually changed the, uh, uh, the face of society or prevented a total breakdown of society. And of course, uh, therefore, he uh, um, very much deserved his title of Zachor Latov, of remembering for good. So that was uh, what we did last year. Now, the whole point of that, what was the point of that story? Can anybody remember the point that the Gemara was trying to make when it told us that story uh, last week? What was the point of the story? Good story, but why did, he, why did the Gemara bring it? Anybody remember? What were they trying to prove or not prove? OK, well, the question was, do you need to have three people to do smicha? Because remember, our Mishnah said you need three judges to do smichat zekenim. 
you need three people, three people who have been ordained to do the next ordination, to do the next smicha. So the question was, is that true? What about Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava? He was sat there between the mountains and he did smicha. And if you remember, we had a discussion about, well, um, 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 maybe um, this was a horat sha'ah. Maybe this was just a one-off law because it was an emergency that he was allowed to do it on his own. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that might have been uh, Michael Krause's suggestion uh, last week. Um, and in fact, what the Gemara says was that there were three of them. Uh, only the other two were of a much lesser um, uh, level of greatness than Rabbi Yudha ben Bava, and therefore they weren't mentioned. Bit schwach, if you ask me, but that is what the uh, Gemara's answer was. So over here, you can see where my marker is. The proof is refuted, i.e. the proof that you only need one person for smicha is refuted because there may have been other sages performing the smicha with Rabbi Yudha ben Bava, uh, and the fact that they were not mentioned was due to the honor of Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava, who was the great, greatest amongst them. That's where we left it last time. And now the Gemara asks a question about the story. The story was brought to uh, answer... Tony, can I question. ask you, was it, was it more important than to have the Semicha than the Kuak Nefesh to save his life? Um, because, I mean, they knew what was going to happen, more or less. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it privately or in secret. Well, I suppose, I suppose um, they all probably thought they would get away with it. Um, the question, the, if I can just frame your question slightly differently. Right, yes. Um, like this. The yes. question is, there is a mitzvah in the Torah, which we read, if I'm not mistaken, David will be able to uh, confirm or correct. We read a couple of weeks ago which says, V'nishmartem ma'od et nafshotechem, or le nafshotechem, actually. Uh, and you shall guard very carefully your soul, whatever that means. And the Chachamim use that uh, expression, which, which is in the Torah, as a positive commandment that you have to look after your health. Um, many people, myself included, um, who believe that smoking is forbidden, Alpi uh, Halacha, will quote this Pasuk as uh, a proof to it. You're not allowed to put yourself in danger. So, uh, because that's a, it's, a, it's a mitzvah in the Torah, you shall guard very carefully your soul or your life. Um, for example, uh, there is a serious question whether uh, a person is allowed to go bungee jumping or skydiving or any of those other things that is very dangerous without good reason so the question i would ask is um can you say it's pikuach nefesh well you might be able to say that you know it, there was a danger to life here and as it turned out he did get killed um and um so your questions are very valid question even if we say um, well, it wasn't for sure that he'd get killed. It certainly was a dangerous activity that he was doing. Um, it was certainly something which was likely to end in tears um, because, of the, uh, because of this decree. So the question is, did he have the right to do that? That's a very good question, Johnny. Um, do you have the right to put yourself in danger in order to save society from anarchy which is what he was doing mm. um it's a hard question um and i think that you would have to say that because of the potential consequences that the the torah would not be uh, kept in its entirety because if there's no if there's no court system then the 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 the, the laws will not be kept i mean that's that's a fact um, so you could argue that actually that this was something which um, would lead to the breakdown of society if it wasn't done, and therefore uh, it was uh, permitted. I personally have never read any question against what he did, but I think your question is a fair question. 
Um, um, and I think the answer would have to be that the consequences were so great uh, of not doing it that um, it was, if you like, worth the sacrifice. Good okay. question. Yes, Leon. Yeah, thank you. There is also the immediate consequence of saving the lives of his students, his, his um, ordained rabbis, because he told them to get out of there quick. Yes, I mean, I think one, once, once he got to that position, then that was the saving of, of their lives. That's true. Johnny's question really was before that, was he allowed to actually do what he did in the first place? Was he allowed to put himself in danger and in potentially mortal danger um, in order to ordain these rabbis? It was not one of the three cardinal sins for which one has to give up one's life, which are uh, sexual immorality, uh, murder, and um, um, what's the third one? Um, idolatry. Yeah. Idolatry, that's the third one. Right, has a mental blank there for a minute. Um, so uh, uh, unless, of course, you say that um, idolatry is what would have come as a result of the breakdown of, of Jewish society, potentially. Don't know. Good question. Um, and I, and uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's one of those questions where um, you could argue it both ways. Um, very interesting. It'd be interesting to know. Maybe we'll give this job to David. He's good at this little research. Uh, maybe David can look over the next week and see if anybody actually asks that question anywhere as to whether he was permitted to put himself in that sort of danger. David, you're willing to take that job on? Yes, good nod from David. Excellent. Right. So, how many rabbis do you know in Manchester who smoke, Johnny? <laughs> many. Many. They're, exactly. all, they're all they're all doing wrong, in my yeah. humble opinion. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that I don't think that in post nineteen, I don't know, mid sixties, I don't think there was any doubt beyond the mid-60s, that smoking was a serious, uh, um, a serious danger to health. I think before that, you could argue that the evidence wasn't that clear, um, but I don't think that you could argue beyond the mid-60s uh, that, that wasn't uh, known by everybody. So I think anybody smoking beyond the mid-60s uh, is uh, over, is, is, is transgressing the commandment of that's my view. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, now, the story uh, which was brought for the point of, of proving how many judges were needed for smicha um, told us that Rabbi Yudha ben Bava um, ordained five and some say six students at this time, one of whom was Rabbi Meir. And remember, I told you that Rabbi Meir uh, is uh, the one who uh, is usually given the, uh, uh, whose opinion is, is ascribed to him when there is no person uh, said. So if it just says uh, an anonymous opinion, that is usually Rebbe Meir. Rebbe Meir was very, very prolific in his uh, pronouncements, in his piskei uh, din. Uh, um, so the Gemara asks, uh, a question about the veracity of our story. And the Gemara says, the Rebbe Meir, Rebbe Yehuda ben Bava smache. Did Rebbe Yehuda ben Bava really give smicha to Rebbe Meir? Uh, I know something else, says the Gemara. Vaha ama rabba bar barchana ama Rebbe Yochna. Did not Rabbi Barachana say in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Kol Haomer Rabbi Meir Lo Smacho Rabbi Akiva, Eino Ela Toe? Anybody that says that Rabbi Meir was not given smicha by Rabbi Akiva has made a mistake. In other words, a long winded way of saying Rabbi Meir received his smicha from Rabbi Akiva. But we've just read a story that says he got his smicha from 
Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava. So what was it? Rabbi Akiva or Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava? And does it matter? So what's the answer? Without looking on, what's the answer? That he got a, a second uh, higher smicha from, uh, from one of them. Okay, so, so that's a good, good answer, Marcel. You can have, as we discussed, I think about three or four weeks ago, there are all sorts of different smichas you can get today. You can get a, a smichat rabbanim, you can get a smichat dayanim, you can get a smichat uh, um, yore yore, you can get all sorts of different types of smicha. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable that he would have got smicha from both of them maybe uh, on different uh, um, different categories or what have you. Um, and in fact, that is similar to the answer that the Gemara gives. Um, the Gemara answers, Smechei um, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva did give him smicha. Now, this is quite remarkable. The lucky blue. People did not accept that smicha from Rabbi Akiva. Can you imagine that? Somebody gets smicha from, I don't know, um, Rav Moshe Feinstein, right? The Rabbi Akiva of his day, right? And somebody says, no, nah, I'm not accepting his smicha. Why would they do that? Politics. Oh, uh, yes. Just like Very today. Likely. Very likely. Very likely, we're not accepting him. He's a Spargy, we don't want his smicha, it doesn't count. Or he's an Ashkenazi, or he's a Litvak, he's a Chosid. No, no, no. So yeah, could be politics. Actually, what the, what the what Rabbi Steinsaltz tells us, and this is based on, on, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, on the Midrash here, it, on the, uh, on the Mephoshim, is that people didn't accept it because Rabbi Meir was very young at the time. Um, and um, we know, don't we, that um, being young is a significant disadvantage when it comes to being a rabbi. How do we know that? You waited 60 years. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> the guy, the the uh, the, uh, the head of the uh, of the Sanhedrin who turned white overnight. Yes, exactly, Michael. Rebbe Lazar ben Azaria. Rebbe Lazar ben Azaria. Remember, he was eighteen when they appointed him, uh, albeit on a temporary basis. They appointed him to be the uh, Rosh Sanhedrin, um, and he turned white overnight. Um, probably from the stress of being in charge, but he says, I am like a man of 70 years old. We say that in the Haggadah, uh, that story. And, uh, and in fact, he was 18 years old. He wasn't 17, but he turned white overnight because he was so young that the older rabbis did not take him seriously. Um, and, it would have been difficult for uh, him to have commanded the authority, uh, to have commanded the respect of the uh, other rabbis uh, over whom he was the leader. So uh, there was a miracle happened and he turned white overnight and he looked like an old man. Um, so there, from there, we, we can see that at least in the days of uh, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Meir, being young was a disadvantage or looking young at least, was a disadvantage in terms of the rabbinate. So Rabbi Meir, who got his smicha from the greatest uh, Tana of all, well, maybe the second greatest after Rabbi Uda Nasi, uh, Rabbi Akiva, um, certainly um, reminds me of, of Brian Clough, the Havdil, uh, who says, I'm not saying that I'm the best manager ever, but I'm in the top one. That was his, one of his famous quotes. Anyway, so Rabbi Akiva, if he wasn't the, if he wasn't the, the top, he was in the top two. Uh, and yet, people didn't accept his smicha when he gave it to Rabbi Meir. And so later on, um, Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava gave him a second smicha, uh, and they accepted it because he was older. Um, so uh, I think that's quite an interesting little uh, uh, tidbit 
that the Gemara just throws in as a as a by the way. Okay, so now we come to our little symbol telling us uh, we've got a, a newish a newish subject. We're still on the subject of smicha, and um, we're still on the subject of smicha. Um, Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, "Ein smicha." There is no smicha. Smicha cannot be given or received. Well, maybe I don't know what that means. No, 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 I'm jumping the gun there. But let's just say it as it says it in the Gemara. There is no smicha outside of Israel. Now, without looking at the notes down there on the side, I've taken them away now so you can't look at them. Uh, any suggestions as to why um, we're told that smicha cannot take place outside Eretz Yisrael? It can be politics. They didn't want anybody from Bavel to be have smicha out there. Um, yeah, well, you you like your politics, don't you, uh, um, uh, Michael? Um, Yes, well, listen, that's happened here in Israel, has it not? Um, the gay root of very, very acceptable bate din in America and in other places are not accepted um, here in uh, Eretz Israel. Um, so, uh, and that is entirely political. That is absolutely nothing to do with halacha. Um, and so you may well be right. Um, however, um, there is uh, uh, an explanation brought in the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, um, and that is, uh, if you wouldn't mind finding chapter 35 of Bamidbar, uh, Leon, um, and we'll just have a look um, at what it says over here. Have a look over here in the notes while Leon's getting the pasuk ready. Over here, the Jerusalem Talmud gives a reason for this, explaining that only in Eretz Yisrael can the verse, which Leon will read for us in a minute, set, be said with regard to the court, be applied, as Eretz Yisrael is described as the dwelling place of the Jewish people. Okay? Um, and so, um, and then um, others suggest that ordination is in some ways similar to the transference of the divine presence, in that the one being ordained is given some of the power of Moses, and it has been stated that the divine presence does not rest outside of Eretz Yisrael. Chidoshe Geonim. So um, let's have a look at the uh, Pasuk here in Numbers 35. Let's just, uh, I'll share the screen with you so you can have a look at it as well. Okay, so here we are in verse 29. Uh, well, let's go a bit further back. What we're talking about here uh, is the, um, we're talking about the Are Miklat, um, the, uh, <coughs> the cities of refuge when the uh, accidental murderer, although accidental manslaughterer, I suppose is more accurate, um, is a, a runs off and takes refuge in these cities, and the Goel Adam, the avenger, can't get at him whilst he's in the cities of refuge. And um, the Pasot tells us, uh, verse 29, These shall be for you a decree of justice for your generations in all your dwelling places. Whoever smites a person, according to the testimony of witnesses, shall one kill the murderer. But a single witness shall not testify against a person regarding death. Okay, so um, we're talking about the, um, we're talking about Goyla Dam, we're talking about the cities of refuge. And in the middle of it there, there is this statement, um, which seems a bit out of place. These shall be for you a statute of justice for all your generations in all your dwelling places. 
So the question I've got is, what's it doing there in the middle of this story? If you were to read um, verse 28, miss out 29 and go on to 30. Do that for us, Leon. Read 28 and then 30 and miss out 29. For he must dwell in the, his city of refuge until the death of the Kohen Godal. And, af <clears throat> and after the death of the Kohen Godal, the murderer shall return to the land of his possession. Whoever smites a person, according to the testimony of witnesses, shall one kill the murderer. But a single witness shall not testify against a person regarding death. Now, you're not going to say to me, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. We need something to tell us that there should be a statue of justice in all your dwelling places. We don't need that puzzle. 29 there makes no sense at that time. It doesn't add anything and, and it, you're not gonna miss it if it goes. So what's it doing there? That's question one. Question two is, these shall be for you a statute of justice for all your generations in all your dwelling places. Now, the Yerushalmi learns that where it says in all your dwelling places, learns out that that means that is referring to Eretz Yisrael. Okay? Um, and I've got an issue with that because I think it means exactly the opposite. If you did it's not right have... Down, right? If right you did not down. have that word... Um, if you do not have that, those words, Bechol Moshvotichem, in all your dwelling places, and it just says, you shall have a statue of justice for all your generations. Fine. In all your dwelling places? What does that mean to you, Johnny? Yeah, wherever you live. Yeah, wherever you live. Absolutely the opposite of what the Yerushalmi is saying. Because okay, is, I asked you what Rashi said on that, that's all right. What Rashi says on that, let's have a look. Just out of interest. Let's have a look. Let's show what Rashi says on that part. Look. Rashi says, and uh, this teaches that the minor Sanhedrin functions outside the land as long as there is one functioning in the land of Israel, namely while the temple stood. Uh, and that is from Gemara Machus uh, 7a. So, in fact, Rashi, uh, at least the first half of that Rashi, agrees with my interpretation, yeah. which is that the Cholmosh Votechem actually means the opposite of what the Yerushalmi is saying, that it means only in Eretz Yisrael. Um, Rashi does say uh, there's a caveat that there has to be a functioning, um, there has to be a functioning Sanhedrin in Eretz Yisrael. Um, to enable uh, an outside Eretz Israel Sanhedrin to function. Um, and, and maybe we'll, we need to go to the Gemara and actually look at that at some point. But this, uh, this question of what does this Bechol Moshvotechem means, um, and, and it's really, I think if we go back to our Gemara, and, uh, or, or let's go back to the footnotes in the Steinsalz at least, let me uh, bring that back up on the screen. There we are. So, um, the Jerusalem Talmud gives a reason for explaining that only in Eretz Yisrael can the verse in all of your dwelling places said with regard to the court be applied, as Eretz Yisrael is described as the dwelling place of the Jewish people. So, uh, what the Yerushalmi is saying, and that makes sense because you remember the Yerushalmi was written in, not actually in Jerusalem, uh, but it was written in uh, in Eretz Israel. Um, they are obviously going to say, aren't they? And maybe this is where Michael's point comes in, the political point. They're going to say, Bechol Moshvotechem, in all your dwelling places, means in all the places where you ought to be dwelling, which is Eretz Israel. And uh, wherever you are in Bavel, you lot, uh, you shouldn't be there. 
because that is not Moshevotechem, that is not where you ought to be dwelling. So they are interpreting the Pasuk, Bechol Moshevotechem, meaning in all the places where Jews ought to be living, which is really only Eretz Israel. And the, reason, the people that say that are the people who are writing the Yerushalmi uh, in the uh, land of Israel. So uh, I think it probably turns out that Michael's right in the end, that there is a political element uh, to the statement. One second, Johnny. The second uh, suggestion um, is, uh, I think, a little bit more acceptable to me in that we do see where Moshe Rabbeinu gives his um, gives his uh, uh, um, some of his powers, if you like, to Yehoshua, that it is done in the presence of Hashem. Um, and uh, others suggest that ordination is in some ways similar to the transference of the divine presence, in that one being ordained is given some of the power of Moses, and it has been stated that the divine presence does not rest outside of Eretz Israel. Um, I think that that is a, I, I, I personally think that's a better explanation because I think the verse that they, the Yerushalmi quotes um, is a little, bit, um, a little bit problematic. Yes, Johnny. The bottom paragraph on, on Halakha and Rabbi Ishtayim says, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what it means. On the right, we do not ordain outside of Eretz Yisrael, but a messenger can do it for you. Yeah, that's the Rambam's opinion. Um, yeah. We'll come to that in a minute because there's a, there's a machlokus in actual halacha yeah. um, um, as to whether uh, smicha can or cannot be given outside of Eretz Yisrael. Um, so we'll come back to that that point over there. Okay. So, Isn't there another problem there? Is with all these exiles, the exiles going on, it would be impossible for anybody to get smicha after the exiles, the dis destruction of the temples and the the fact that very few Jews were living in Israel after the, certainly after destruction of the second temple. Yeah, I think that that's where the, um, that's where the politics comes in, isn't it? That um, if you're going to say that only uh, inside Eretz Israel can you have ordination, then your major centres of, um, of Jewish learning and living which, as you say, were outside of Eretz Israel, uh, in, 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 in between the two temples, it was in Bavel. And after the destruction of the second temple, um, of course, it was, um, uh, it was ev all, all through Europe um, um, and eventually through uh, going westwards through, uh, from Italy through into, uh, into Europe. Um, then you would have no ordination and of course isn't that, said, isn't, that, uh, isn't that slightly separate the politics is one thing but uh, logically forget the politics for the time being but logically if there's very little a very small seat of learning in, in israel um there's going to be very few samikas yes that's that's right and the problem with that of course is what we said right at the beginning why was rabbi Yehuda ben bava such a uh, a hero because he managed to uh, maintain the chain of smicha. If there's no smicha, there's no courts. If there's no court, there's no people keeping halacha. And you see it all the time. It's happened. If you go into Chutz Laaretz, where there is no, uh, no teeth to the basti, right? Uh, people don't take any notice of them. Uh, I, I have been... Um, uh, I have uh, been involved with a number of cases where um, people who you would expect to abide by a decision of a Beit Din completely ignore it because it doesn't suit them for whatever reason and they have no sanctions. The Beit Din has no sanction. Um, the only sanction it's got is... Uh, to make an announcement, which they very rarely do, and put somebody in cheyrem. But effectively, a bet din outside of Eretz Yisrael has very little teeth. Um, so, for example, um, somebody who, um, who refuses 
to keep the halacha on certain things. I don't know, let's say a business deal. They go to the bet din, and the bet din says, right, Reuven owes Shimon a hundred pounds. And Reuven says, I'm not paying. So what's the bet din going to do about it? Nothing, because they haven't got any, they've got no sanctions, right? Because they're operating sub judice. They're operating outside of the framework of um, the, the, the the national law. OK, they've got no they've got no sanctions at all. Um, so Reuven says, I'm not paying. So what can they do? They say, right, well, you'll not have an earlier in shul. We'll put a, we'll put a petek up on in in. in MH that says Ruben's a very naughty boy and he's not paid his debts. Right. First of all, they won't do it because they've got not not only they've not got any teeth, they haven't got any other part of their anatomy that uh, gives them any kind of courage. Uh, but the fact is, who cares? So you're absolutely right, Michael, that um, um, the 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 if you're gonna say there's no smicha outside of Eretz Israel, and therefore you've got no rabbis. Therefore, you've got no bet din. And the, the small amount of power that they do have, they wouldn't even have that. You'd have completely lose the entirety of uh, uh, Jewish civil law. Um, and, and, that, and that would be the consequence. So I believe, I believe that that is why, uh, actually, at the end of the day, the halakha is that you can get and give smicha outside of Eretz Yisrael. That's how we pasken. But uh, at this point in the Gemara, the Gemara is discussing this. The, the Havamina, uh, that is the hypothesis of the Gemara at this point, is a statement by Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who says, Ein smicha b'chutza la'aretz. Okay, that's it. That's what he says. There is no smicha outside of Israel. Now, the Gemara is going to drill down into that statement and say, hang on a minute, what exactly do you mean when you say, there is no ordination outside of Eretz Yisrael? So the Gemara asks, my ein smicha, what does it mean when it says, ein smicha, there is no smicha? And then it gives a hypothesis to answer its own question. It says, Ilema, if you will say the law dine dine knasot klal bechutzala aretz, if you'll say that there cannot be any adjudication of fines outside of Eretz Israel, if you're saying that that's what it means, because if there's no smicha, there's no dealing with fines, if that's what you're saying, that can't be right. And here is the Mishnah in Makot, which we just quoted um, in, in Rab Stein's out notes. Um, Vahatanan, have we not learnt in Makot, in the Masechet Makot, Sanhedrin noheget bein ba'aretz ubein ba'chutzel aretz. There is the Sanhedrin functions both in and outside of Eretz Israel, And that's a Mishnah. So What's Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi talking about? He can't be. He can't mean exactly what he's just said. Ein smicha bechutzal aretz, because it goes against the Mishnah in Makon. You're not allowed to do that. You can't go against the Mishnah. Mishnah says it. That's it. Unless you come up with another Mishnah which contradicts it, and then you try and uh, work out what's going on. So Ella, rather, what does it mean? When it says ein smicha b'chutzal aretz, it doesn't mean that smicha does not work outside of Eretz Israel. What it means is, says this Gemara, delo samchinon b'chutzal aretz. We don't actually do the smicha outside of Eretz Israel. In other words, somebody can function as a rabbi outside of Eretz Israel, in order to have courts, in order to deal with fines in our situation. But he can only get that smicha in Eretz Israel. That's what the Gemara is saying at this moment. 
that when Rabbi Shua ben Levi says, Ein smicha he didn't mean that a smicha is, is worthless outside of Eretz Yisrael because it doesn't work because there's no courts. What he means is that in order to get smicha, you have to be in Israel. There's no giving out of smicha except in Eretz Yisrael. That's what the Gemara says at the moment. But now the Gemara is going to question that. And it says, hang on a minute, Pshita. That's obvious. That's obvious. How can it be? How can it be a situation where you've got rabbi blogs in Yerushalayim giving smicha to Rabbi Jones, who's in Los Angeles. How can that be? It's obvious. It's obvious, says the Gemara. Somchin aretz, the nismachin aretz. It's obvious that if those who are um, giving out the smicha um, were outside of Eretz Israel, I said that wrong before. Rabbi Bloggs, who's giving out the smicha, he's in Los Angeles. And Rabbi Jones, who's getting the smicha, he's in Yerushalayim. Well, that won't work. How does that work? Uh, that won't work. Ha Amrin and That I understand. That's obvious. Somebody who's outside Eretz Israel cannot give smicha to somebody who is inside Eretz Israel. Ella, somchin ba'aretz v'nismachin ba'chutza la'aretz mai. What is the halacha about the other way around? So the giver of smicha is in Israel and the receiver of the smicha is in Chutz Laaretz. Does that work? That's the question that the Gemara is asking now. This statement, Rabbi Shur ben Levi, which at first glance looked like a very straightforward, simple statement. There's no smicha outside of Israel. Uh, it turns out it's not quite so simple. The Gemara has agreed that the person giving smicha has to be in Eretz Israel. But what about a person who's giving smicha from Eretz Israel to somebody who's not there in front of him, not in Eretz Israel? He's in England or America or wherever. Does it count? In other words, as he said this, may ordination be conferred from a distance in this situation. And now the Gemara yeah. will give us a story to help us clarify this question. Okay. Everybody understand the question? Yeah? Okay. So Gemara says, Tashma, come and listen. De Rabbi Yochanan Hava mitzta'er alei de Rav Shemen bar Abba de lo hava gabai de lismachei. Rabbi Yochanan was upset, mitzta'er. That's a modern Hebrew word. What does it mean? If you say, ani mitzta'er, I apologize. Correct, Martel. I apologize. And uh, what does that mean when you say, I apologize? You say, I I'm distressed about what I did. I'm, I'm sorry that I did that. It distresses me that whatever it is you're apologizing for. It means pain and pain. It's a mean pain as well, I think. Correct. It's, that's exactly the root of the word. Yes. Sa'ar. Sa'ar, Sa'ar is pain. Yeah. Ani mitzta'er it is a hit pa'el form. It is a reflexive form. Ani mitzta'er means I have got pain upon myself. Yeah. Like mitlabesh, I dress myself. Yeah. So mitzta'er is I bring pain upon myself. In other words, I apologize. I'm sorry. I feel bad. Um, so Rabbi Yochanan was distressed. He felt bad um, about Rev Shemen Bar Abba, this chap called Shemen Bar Abba. Delo have a Um So he was not able. Uh, to give him smicha. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Steinsaltz expands the translation a bit and says, 
as the latter, i.e. Shem, Rav Shemin, Rav Shemin Ba'aba, Abba, was not with the other sages at the time they received the consent of the Nasi, so that Rabbi Yochanan could ordain him. Okay, so that's part of the first part of the story. Rabbi Shimon ben Zero v'chad di'imei. In addition, there was somebody else, um, Rabbi Shimon ben Zerod and another. So there were three, these three people who Rabbi Yochanan was not able to give smicha to. And then the Gemara um, says, well, I'm not sure about these personalities. It might have been somebody else. But Amalei and others say Rabbi Yonatan ben Achmai v'chad di'imei. It doesn't matter to us who they really were. Not, we don't really know who any of them are. So whoever these people were, um, Chad de Hava Gabai who was smachu. And who is he? This Rabbi Shimon ben Zerud. Um, the Gemara says, Chad de Hava Gabai who lo samchu. The Gemara continues, although those two sages were equal in stature, the sages ordained only the one who was with them in Eretz Israel, And they did not ordain the other one who was not with them. Okay, so it doesn't matter who the, the don't, don't get um, sidetracked between by the names. Fact is that there was one of these rabbis who was present in Eretz Israel, and one who was not. And this story tells us that the, only the one who was present in Eretz Israel was able to receive smicha. The one who was not in Eretz Israel, whichever one of the ones it was, doesn't matter which, was not able to receive smicha. So what does that tell us? That tells us um, that smicha can only be given inside of Eretz Yisrael. That's what the uh, question is. So let's go back to our question. May ordination be conferred from a distance in this situation, i.e. where the giver is in Eretz Yisrael and the receiver is in Chutz Laaretz? The answer from our story is... No, no, because Rabbi Yochanan was not able to do it. He wanted to give one of these rabbis smicha, or both of these rabbis smicha, and he couldn't, because one of them wasn't there. Only the one that was there could get the smicha. So as we stand at the moment, the Gemara is telling us that you can't get smicha unless you are present with the person giving smicha in Eretz Yisrael. Now, um, let's go on. Any questions so far on where the Gemara is holding at the moment? No. Okay, let's go on. Um, now, um, whilst we're at it, um, we're coming, uh, this is a bit of a digression now. Uh, but it will be familiar to you, this digression, um, because we're going to um, quote the Sefer Shmuel Aleph, which we have been learning for quite some time. Um, so, Gemara relates several other incidents regarding coordination. Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Hoshaya, Havaka Mishtaket, Rabbi Yochanan, Le Mismachinhu. Okay, um, Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Hoshaya um, were due to be given smicha by Rabbi Yochanan. Lo hava mistaya milta. But he just couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Rabbi Yochanan could not get round to giving smicha to these two people, to Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Hoshana. Lo hava mistaya. He couldn't manage it. Mistaya milta. And it caused him a great deal of distress. Mitzta'er, there's that word again. Tuva comes from the word tov, good. How are you going you're gonna to say to me, well, why is that word good meaning very there? How can it be good distressed? Well, the Mancunians amongst us, I'm not sure about the Scousers, but the Mancunians amongst us would understand that very well. How do we understand the word good when it comes to uh, uh, something like that? We would say Rabbi Yochanan was good and proper distressed. 
right? He was distressed, good and proper. Okay, so that's obviously where it comes from. Mitzda'er Tuva. He was well, that's another expression they use in Manchester. It's, I think it's more of a youngster's expression. He was well troubled by it. He was right pained. He was right pained, that's it. So, Mitzda'er uh, Tuva. So, um, uh, Rabbi, Yo Rabbi Yochanan tried to give smicha to these people. Um, and um, so, for whatever reason, he was not successful. And as a by the way, um, it, it, we're not told why he was not able to do it. Um, and there are various, if you look in the art scroll um, um, commentary, uh, they give a couple of potential reasons. Leon, do you want to share those with us? The potential reasons why Rabbi Yochanan never managed to give smicha to these two gentlemen. Uh, footnote 15 um, quotes, whenever Rav Hanina and Rav Hoshaya were in Rav Yochanan's presence, he could not find two other judges to join him and form a court of three to ordain them. Wait, one sec, stop there one sec, Leon, no. which proves something, doesn't it? That would prove, if that was the case, Correct, Michael. That would prove that you need three people to give. So that's a question against Al Gamora, isn't it? Why did Al Gamora, who brought the proof of Rabbi Yuda ben Bava, who we said was on his own there, and they said, no, he wasn't on his own. He had two other nochschleppers with him. Um, why didn't they bring this story that Rabbi Yochanan was unable to give smicha to Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Hoshaya? Um, because he couldn't find anybody else to do it with him. That would have been uh, a counter proof, wouldn't it? Uh, or a good proof that you needed three. I don't know why that wasn't brought as a proof, but when I read that uh, a part of the footnote, it struck me as, as being uh, a stronger proof than, than we had uh, earlier on, or at least a counter proof to Rabbi Uda Membaba. There is another reason given in that footnote, Leon. Apparently, Rashi must hold that every member of an ordination panel must be ordin ordained himself. For Rav Yochanan could surely have found two other non-ordained judges with whom to form a court. Yeah, this is so, so what he could have, what Rav Yochanan could have done is what we do here at Rosh Hashanah. Three people, you're a based in. Fine, I'm Rav Yochanan. You get two people off the street, two Jews. Are you Jewish? Yeah, right, you're in. It's a bit like the Spanish Inquisition. You know, can you keep a secret? Yeah, right, well, you're in. So um, uh, there you go. Uh, the, um, the fact that he didn't do that um, shows that it, Rashi's view uh, must be that you need three ordained uh, judges, not just three judges, three ordained judges. is one step further. We originally said one on his own is OK. And then we said, no, you need three. Rash is now upping the ante even more and saying you need three fully ordained judges. OK, carry on, Leon. This is at variance with Rambam's view that only one of the three judges on the court need be ordained. According to Rambam, Rab Yochanan must have been unable to ordain the two for some other reason. Perhaps he had no time whenever they were available. Yeah, so the Rambam's struggling a bit, really, uh, in, in that regard, because, uh, I mean, how long does it take to give smicha? You know, um, he just didn't have time. Uh, but either way, um, it's an interesting thing. Rabbi Yochanan was distressed. And they said to him, what did they say? Amrule, these two uh, potential um, ordainees, is that a word, ordainees? I don't know, I'll have to ask Michael's leaf. Um, uh, these two potential rabbis said to Rabbi Yochanan, lo nitzda'er mar, do not be distressed, master, da'anan, Midabate Ailey, 
Ka'atinan. We are, we have come, we are dis descendants of the house of Ailey. Now, without looking on, um, what's that got to do with the price of cheese? What are they saying? When they say to, um, to Rabbi Yochanan, uh, don't, don't be distressed that you've not given us smicha. We're from the house of Ailey. What might that mean? They might think we're already good enough to be rabbis. We're already... Okay. So what Johnny suggests is, you don't need to be distressed, Rabbi Yochanan, because we're from the house of Ailey, and um, we're already... That, that's good enough to be a rabbi. We don't, you don't need to give us smicha. We're already there. We don't, we don't need it because we're from the house of Ailey. That's what you're saying, yes, Johnny? Yes. Okay, yeah. any other suggestions? Well, I'd like to just, can I just ask a question about that? When they say Beit Ailey, are they using that term Beit Ailey like you would say Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, or are they referring it to that they come from the family of Ailey? They're referring to the family of Ailey. They are direct descendants of Ailey oh. HaKohen. Oh. Any oh. other suggestions as opposed to Johnny's suggestion that the descendants of Ailey HaKohen are already, as it were, Ke'ilu, as if they were ordained and they don't need ordination from Rabbi Yochanan. Any other suggestions as to what they were getting at? It's, it's just the opposite. Yes, oh. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but but uh, I, 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 I have to be, I have to admit, Johnny, mm -hmm. that when I first read that Gemara, I thought like you. I also thought that that was what they were saying, that they yeah. were saying that we're from, we've got yichas, we don't need yeah. uh, we, that. I also thought that. Turns out that both of us are completely wrong. Yes, Jeffrey. Well, I understood that Ellie's sons were no damn good. And that's why he took uh, Sh uh, Shmuel under his uh, care and, 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 and if you like, promoted Shmuel. So I'm not surprised that um, Ellie's descendants have not come up to scratch. Okay, all right. Now that's that, that's half the answer, Jeffrey. Half the answer. What these rabbis are saying, or what they're not saying, is they're not saying um, we are from the house of Ailey. Ailey's sons were no damn good, and so we're not up to scratch, and we don't deserve smicha. They're not saying that. However. You are absolutely on the right track, because if we go to um, Shmuel Aleph, um, where are we? Um, where are we? Uh, Leon? Chapter, chapter two. Chapter two. That's right. Chapter two, mm -hmm. verse thirty-two. Let's go to Shmuel Aleph. In cheating, Leon. Let's go to Shmuel Aleph chapter two. I'll get it on the screen for you. Hang on a sec. Here we are. Let me share the screen again with you. Tell me when you've got it, Sh Shmuel chapter two. Okay. Right, so if we go down here, um, we go to um, HaKadosh Baruch who is not very pleased with Ailey. And why is he not very pleased with Ailey? Because his uh, children, as Jeffrey so succinctly put it, were no damn good, right? And so let's have a look at Sukim from verse 30 onwards, Leon. Therefore, this is the word of Hashem, God of Israel. I had indeed said that your family and your father's family would walk before me forever. But now, the word of Hashem, far be it from me to do so, for I honour those who honour me, and those that scorn me will be accursed. Be behold, days are coming when I shall cut off your arm and the arm of your father's family, for there being any old person 
in your family. Okay, stop there. Stop there. And let's look at the Hebrew of the last bit. Um, Leon just read out, there shall not be any old person in your household. Here on the screen it says an elder, which is a slightly different translation. If I said to you, what's an old person? You would say it's a person who has reached an old age. If I said to you, what is an elder? You would say that's a person of seniority. If you're an elder of a community, it means you're held in high regard. It means that you are uh, uh, given a kavod, etc. Look at the Hebrew. Lo ye zaken bevetcha kol yamim. Word zaken can mean both of those things. It can be, mean an old person, but it can also mean a rabbi, can't it? How do we know that? What did Moshe do to the 70 zakenim, the 70 elders? They got smicha, didn't they? They got brought in front of the Ohel Moed and they were given smicha and they were given smicha and they became zakenim. So what they were saying here, what these two rabbis are saying is, you don't need to be distressed, Rabbi Yochanan. There's a reason that you couldn't get round to giving us smicha, because we're not allowed to be smicha. We're not allowed to be rabbis, because the Pasuk says that the direct descendants of Eli will not be zakain. They'll not be elders. So therefore, we can't be rabbis. So Rabbi Yochanan, the mm. reason that you couldn't get round to it was not because you couldn't find any judges, like Rashi said, and not because you didn't have time, like Rambam said, but because HaKadosh Baruch Hu arranged it that way, because the curse of Eli's family is spelt out in verse 31 of chapter 2 of Shmuel Aleph. How amazing is that? Uh, and I think at that point we'll stop and we'll carry on with this discussion next week because we're out of time. Any they comments? Why were they called, are they talking about Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Oshia saying that or not? Yeah, yeah. Why were they called rabbis then? Really? Ah, good question. Good question. We'll deal with that next week, Johnny. Oh, okay. Excellent question. Okay. Could I, Rabbi? Any other any other questions or comments? Okay. No, Have a good you. week, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Okay, Thank you.